Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. We have a uh, listener question that we're dealing with today on the podcast. Craig wrote in and asked, how do we retain what we read? He's getting back into uh, reading novels. And so he wants to know, you know, how is it that you kind of hold on to this stuff uh, as you're going? Because it's reading a novel. We like to act like it's not any work at all. Uh, But with all of the cares of the world constantly pulling us in so many directions, uh, Craig is a husband and a father. You know, it's a lot to sit down and decide I'm going to read when I could be doing something else. Um, and so I think it's a pretty natural question uh, or, or it's a pretty uh, natural desire to want to say, like, if I'm going to sit down and commit to reading, uh, I want to I want this to mean something. I, I want to um, hold on to it after this experience is over. Um so I, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, so now the poem, right, Steve? Oh, I was <laughs> my my hopes had gotten up, and uh, <laughs> sitting here on the back porch, I I thought maybe that dog across the way had distracted you, and he forgot his poem. Oh, no, wow. no. Now I will say uh, that because we're talking retention, uh, it makes perfect sense that I would. Um, recite a poem that I have, uh, internalized that I've retained. Um, but you're not going to do that, but I'm not going to, (laughs) no, I'm not going to. Well, the only thing I remember is frost and, and, um, I like this one better anyway for, for what we're discussing. Um, so this this is is someone other than frost, someone other than someone before frost. In fact, yes. Excellent. Uh, this is William Wordsworth. Uh, one of the romantics. I think he was actually one of the lake poets. Yep. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So um, he's one of the lake poets, which that's a that's a fun rabbit trail to go down if you if you uh, want to um, c- sort of figuring those guys out. But anyway, uh, Wordsworth has uh, that I know of three sonnets that are entitled "To Sleep" that he's writing to uh, sleep. Right. When you've when you've got a good title, why mess with it? <laughs> Just keep going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's got more to say. Um, so as far as I know, uh, Wordsworth uh, had insomnia. He had he had difficulty sleeping. And so um, these sonnets are pretty uh, neat in terms of <laughs> seeing uh, a perspective of sleep. That's that's a little uh, different than maybe most of us sort of view sleep in. In any event, uh, I'd like to read this one because I think it has some, well, I, I don't want to justify it. I just like it. Okay. And, uh, and I, and I want to read it. <laughs> uh, here we go. So this is to sleep. A flock of sheep that leisurely pass by one after one, the sound of rain and bees murmuring, the fall of rivers, winds, and seas, smooth fields, white sheets of water, and pure sky. I have thought of all by turns, and yet do lie sleepless, and soon the small birds' melodies must hear, first uttered from my orchard trees, and the first cuckoo's melancholy cry. Even thus last night, and two nights more I lay, and could not win thee sleep by any stealth. So do not let me wear tonight away. Without thee, what is all the morning's wealth? Come, blessed barrier between day and day, dear mother of fresh thoughts and joyous health. So why this in reading retention? One one of the things that is probably obvious is that if if you go to sleep while reading, you won't remember what you've read. Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, but 
that was that was a totally the case. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> good point. I, I think another reason is uh, this sort of characteristic uh, list at the beginning, right? Um, our poet, uh, in trying to get to something, he's unable to do it. So, so his first, uh, what do you call it? Like his first appeal or his first attempt is to go through the stereotypical things that he knows, right? Counting sheep. Uh, and, so he's yep. counting sheep, thinking of rain, uh, falling on the roof, you know, like these, these characteristic things. Yeah, uh, I, I maybe I don't want to push it too far, but but I, I like the I like the poem um, for its uh, I, what do you want to say? It's it's uh, movement toward uh, the canon. Uh, it's movement toward the what I really want to say is topoi, right? right. The the sort yeah, of it's it's common places. What 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 memory tells us will help us. Right. That, yeah. that if, if I've had difficulty sleeping in the past, thinking of some of these things has helped. I remember that. Therefore, I do that. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. Me- memory is this weird thing. Right. I, I have arguments yeah. with people. It's, it's it is closely identified with attention. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. You know me. I got a whole book literally uh, 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 about human attention. But but the yeah. mind's ability to focus on something and thereby keep it is something we've been arguing about in in Western literature for a really long time, and I think yeah. it's important, right? That your your friend mm-hmm. does not want to read and then forget. It seems like wasted time. Yeah, uh, and in a busy life, you don't want to waste time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yet most of us have had that terrible experience of picking something up that we know we read and being able to remember very little of it. You know, um, I've, I've had that experience with movies, yeah. right? Where, where I've, I've seen a movie. I know I've seen this movie, uh, but I'm going to watch it again because <laughs> yeah. I can't remember what happened. Right. <laughs> um, and, and so part of the argument is, are there just some people gifted with the ability to retain, you know, the quote unquote photographic memory uh, and others are just terrible mm-hmm. at it and that's the way it is. Or is it a acquired and um, nourished, nurtured ability that, that there's real and um, I don't want to use the word logical, but I, that's all that's coming to mind at the moment. Uh, you know, real steps mm-hmm. towards making better? Are, 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 is there a list of things I could do to make myself retain th- things better? Or, right. or you know, th- th- this is the argument, right? The, the, mm-hmm. the tug of war. I think, I think they're both true. Yeah, yes and. Absolutely. It, it, it definitely, uh, I would say that, you know, of course, there are people who, uh, for one reason or another, just seem to be able to uh, remember what they read or what they see or what they come across. Um, And there are others of us who it's more work, you know, you've got to, you've got to put in the work, but I don't think that the work is fruitless. Um, The, there is uh, definitely an improvement that comes with practicing the memory, right? Yeah. Well, right. Uh, So we've made the distinction between a science and an art many times before, but reading and then as a part of that retaining what I've read is an art, right? It is something I do. Mm -hmm. And all arts are a made better with practice, right? Your, your old wrestling Mm -hmm. coach or, or violin teacher reminded you that of a hundred times, right? Practice makes perfect. Um, That's right. uh, So it is something that, that by use becomes better if, and, and I would put the caveat in, it, it, by proper use or by being used well, there you go. It, it becomes better, stronger, more mm-hmm. uh, redoubtable. Um, but but then, secondly, it implies that there is uh, knowledge leading to the proper doing, right? If if, if, if 
previous episode, we talked about cooking. If I'm going to cook well, there, there are certain things I need to know, ostensibly even before approaching mm-hmm. the kitchen or trying to make, you know, I need to know what a cup is as far as mm-hmm. measurement goes and the difference between a cup and a tablespoon. It makes that knowledge makes quite a bit of difference. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and I can go in the kitchen <laughs> and do all sorts of things, but if the knowledge isn't there. So, so with reading and retention, there's, I, I find often that many people just poorly define reading, first of all, as decoding, mm. right? Nice. If you put okay. a series of words in front of me, I can tell you what those words are. And that is reading yeah. at a very basic level. I'm pulling off of, of, of Mortimer Adler's notion that there are four levels to reading. I, I love the fact that he wrote a 440-page book on how to read a book. <laughs> there's a yeah. – there's a, Yes, have you I read, read it? it and taught it. I still teach it. Um, oh it is a gosh. fantastic thing. I saw it and I tried to read it. I was just like, man, well, this it, is a it, lot. So <laughs> I don't – the term textbook applies to that book uh-huh. perhaps more specifically than most textbooks. I believe it is a resource. Yeah. It is a text from which one teaches, not sort of uh-huh. a – autodidactic experience. You don't plow through I, I it. would be yeah. very hesitant to suggest, especially to a young person, that here's a book on how to read a book, go read it, and you'll be a better reader. That's not true. That's precisely how it was introduced to me when I was about yeah, 19. Yeah, no. Bad, 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 bad. Um, and it was too much. It was too much. I just... I wanted to. I tried to. Uh, I picked a few things up. No doubt there were uh, helpful tips. Well, but to- I, I read it, you know, and I just got into it, and I thought... Man, I still got uh, three hundred and seventy yeah. pages of this stuff. Well, so I'm out. so his his point is an excellent distinction between arts and sciences. The first first yeah. third of the book is is almost entirely focused on reading as an art and stating that it's done in four at four levels. Okay, that that the, the most basic decoding yeah. I can read. I learned how to do it in first grade, kind of thing. I can, I know what the words are. Is, is the most basic form of yeah. reading. And for many of my students, they think that when I tell them to read this book, they think that's all I mean. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I started sure, page sure. one and finished page 85 and I read the book. Whatever. Uh, yeah. But he goes and, and, and actually blows most people's minds by saying that the next level up, more intense and more useful, and to the question that we're answering, more capable of retention the second level is inspectional reading or skimming, which I mm-hmm. argued for <laughs> when I was in middle school. <laughs> I tried to convince my teachers <laughs> that I'd read the book. I had thumbed through the pages. Yeah. Now, Adler teaches right. that the art of skimming how to skim involves yeah. you know, for the authors that have that have been nice enough to provide us with a uh, robust table of contents that actually tells us what's in the content. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you see this in, in older works, yeah, right? Yeah, totally. Uh, but some of the newer ones, it just says chapter one, chapter two. It's just designed to help you get to the right page number in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but he, but he says the, the, uh, table of contents, the blurb on the back, the title, uh, first and last, uh, paragraph of each chapter, et cetera. He's, he, he teaches you, uh, ways to inspect a work and get the bird's eye view mm-hmm. of the book, mm-hmm. which if you have that, right, many people have taught me that the, that that central to the art of retaining what I read is knowing what the question is and some sense of how the author is answering it, right? Yeah. That if you just jump in and get lost in the trees, you'll totally forget that you're in a forest. And, and so this is Adler's suggestion is that a book worth, some books are only worth a skim. And when you've skimmed it, you go, I don't, yeah. <laughs> this, this, this book is not of any use to me. Sure. And, and there you've saved yourself a considerable amount of time. Good. Right. Good. Yeah. Um, or you've maybe discovered that the, given what the book is about, I only want to read a, a part of it mm-hmm. or given yourself hope if I can get through the first few chapters where he's setting up the situation, 
what I really want to know is towards the end, but I got to read myself right, there. Right, right. Take take hope, dear heart. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah, uh, slog <laughs> through. The, You'll make it's, it. it. It the goods are there. Yeah. You know? uh, and then that, that leads then to the third level of reading, which is what you and I mean when we assign reading to students. Typically, this is that that deep reading, mm-hmm. that analytical reading, mm-hmm. that reading and rereading until I understand it. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's part of the problem, and and, I, and he makes a distinction, and so we need to make a distinction between uh, what I'll call analogical reading and prosaic reading or, or uh, linear reading, right? Some mostly nonfiction books are designed to take you from this point of, of knowing very little about the subject of the book to the end where you know a lot more about it, and they do this in a very linear way. Yeah. Point by point. One plus one plus Here's, one plus one. Yeah, mm-hmm. right, right. Um, uh, whereas analogical or, or narrative stories is trying to get you to picture truth, right? Cool. And, 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 and it has to be approached a little bit different. I don't know how I, – I would actually argue against much inspectional reading for, for narrative, right? Yeah. Because – a lot of the fun is is not knowing what's going <laughs> to come at the end. Right. Yeah. Um, well, and this is surely this is part of his thing. Like when you practice each, he's not saying go read the last page of the novel and see if you want to read it. Right. right. No, you, you've got to you've got to know when to practice. So it's right. I, I agree. I actually I, th- I think I remember the fourth level of reading. Um this is when Adler. What's the most exciting? Yeah, he says that's when you're sort of like merging uh, books about the same topic together. You're like pushing them yep. in conversation with one another. Yep, syntopical reading, syntopical. which is that, that's when you're entering the canon. Yeah. Okay, and he pushes this notion. There are certain great ideas. He lists 102 of them <laughs> <laughs> um, that are that are commonplace to all sincere. Literary discussion, love, freedom, evil, mm-hmm. democracy, right. uh, 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 you know, a lot of relationships sure. Faith, uh, hope, that he love. has. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> um, his his point is that as I start reading uh, what is now for me book E and the author of A and C – disagreed with e Mm -hmm. if i remember what a and c said and see the way in which b agrees with e and so 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 this conversation starts happening where the other authors that i remember reading Mm -hmm. right here's the, the the heart of our question if i've retained it if i remember their points about let's just say freedom yeah and some are arguing freedom is a completely external thing determined by government and determined – and others are arguing it's a complete internal thing. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, 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 Milton's uh, words of Satan that the mind is a place of itself. Right. It can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. Right. You know, um, that, that, that as these voices all start arguing within me, I start forming – now, my own view, as opposed to just seeing the view of a given author in my analytical reading, that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to re- enter into this text so fully that I understand what the author thinks about whatever the subject is. Right. Syntopical is when I've read enough about the topic that I start to see various opinions and form my own well-formed opinion from the various voices that have that have helped teach me. Right. And... Uh, and, and I, I feel like we've, I, I mean, that's a, that's a whole wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. And I do believe that, that Adler has his finger. On the, if you read well, you will retain more. Mm-hmm. No doubt. But it's skirting the issue a little bit because what the listener is asking is <laughs> what are those things that I should do to retain? Well, I think that if you inspect what you're reading before you read it, uh, and in nonfiction, it will help a great deal. Yeah. Uh, but but in fiction, even there, I think it's legitimate. The inspectional reading I invite my students to is not what's going to happen at the end of the story, but why was the story written? 
who wrote it? Mm-hmm. What's the historical context in which it was written? Yeah. And, and I find, like for instance, uh, I've just finished teaching some sophomores about Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Okay. Very few of them knew anything about it. Most of them knew about it through some cartoon or TV show or movie that they had seen. They hadn't read the book. Right. A couple of them said that you know, they just viewed it as a children's story. <laughs> you know, <laughs> fantasy. Right. right? And, and, and yeah. if you just opened up the book and started reading it, I get that. Yeah, There's sure. these little tiny people sure. and these great huge giants and a, and, a, and a land floating in the air and so on and so forth. And people doing all kinds of weird and silly things. It just sounds – it is similar. It's fantastic. Right, to Alice. Yeah. Right. It's Alice going down the rabbit hole mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and can be read at the level of entertainment. You know, the Queen of Hearts is funny. Sure, you know, sure. Or the – the argument about how to crack an egg in, in Gulliver's Travels is by itself entertaining. But when they understand that back behind that is a whole political agenda yeah. that Swift had right. and that he's writing satire and that he is an Irishman closely linked uh, in his own personal life to, to, to British rule and nonetheless concern that that the way the Brits are ruling Ireland is killing off Irishmen. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, you know, it takes it's, it's on a, a new tone. Yeah, right. It, uh, suddenly, I'm I'm not just saying, well, what a silly thing to say. What is he? What is what response is he trying to elicit from his readers? Which, of course, again, uh, it, that's the problem with agenda driven uh, stories. I think it's a great story on its own, and there's many universal truths that it's pulling out. But the specifics to England and Ireland maybe are lost on this. They don't care, right? <laughs> Uh, but but again, so so then that's the question to retain it. Mm-hmm. I'm probably not going to retain the specifics to that, but the principles or the universal truths that come out of that discussion. Right. Well, what it has in, in common, uh, or not not necessarily in common, but but what uh, let's take uh, Adler's ideas. Right. Which of Adler's ideas is it speaking to? Because then all of a yep. sudden, when you when you have inspected. Uh, that and you get a little context, you get a little uh, understanding about sort of what motivated Swift to write it and what a- what Swift actually wrote. I-, I mean, generically, the genre that it's a part of, not the words on the page, but what he saw those words doing. Then all of a sudden, you go, "Wait a minute! This book isn't in conversation with Shel Silverstein." Uh, this book is really more in conversation with George Orwell than uh, I thought, right? Uh, right. I'm not right. saying it's the same genre. I'm just saying there are some interesting conversations that could happen between those two authors if you are uh, – well, if you just if know it, that of, of certain things about each of them. Right. Well, and, and, and if you're willing to read – Broadly. Right. Right. Here's where I get myself in trouble with people. I get asked all the time because I designed it. Why our high school still demands the hard work of the Odyssey, mm-hmm. Virgil, right. Beowulf. Beowulf they kind of get because it's a cool movie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sir Gawain, uh, yeah. you know, pr- pretty much everything prior to. Fitzgerald, th- they want to know why we even have kids read that. Mm. And of course, I often answer with Chesterton's notion of chronological snobberies at play snobbery, here. Just because yeah. it's old doesn't make it bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's universal, it's universal, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, Odysseus is still a man, mm-hmm. and there's a lot about him that we can learn from, uh, even several thousand years later. Um, but but what they often ask is, when are we going to read relevant? Something that the kids can relate to. Yeah. And so I'll, I had this ask of me by a, a – I was substituting for another English teacher. So it was at, at the religious school I teach at, the, the Catholic high school I teach at, several years ago now, many years ago. And they were just starting uh, what I thought was a great modern novel, Golding's uh, Lord of the Flies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was excited to get them started on it. I was sad that I was going to have to – you know give it back to the normal teacher. Yeah, sure. Of course. That's a fun uh, one. But the one little girl, uh, and this was several years ago. So you get, if, if you're familiar with modern literature, this will, this will all fit for you. 
um, she said, when are we ever going to read something relevant and, and <laughs> appropriate? She used the word appropriate, oh, appropriate at the school. OK. And I said, um, well, like what? <laughs> exactly. That, that's and she, interesting. And that you said, should add, Tell me what's appropriate. Yeah, that's a perfect yeah, well, no, setup. Yeah, well, like, well, what do you have in your mind? And she said, well, you know, something like Fifty Shades of Grey or something. Said, oh, oh, buddy. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about the word appropriate for a moment. Because <laughs> I don't think pornography is appropriate. Right. Well, it's not pornography. But <clears throat> she was highlighting the fact that if it isn't just recently written, it doesn't have anything to say to me. And I believe the opposite. Mm. I do not demote or denigrate the reading of current contemporary literature you just have to understand that in our question of retention, mm -hmm. my belief is it's going to be much harder to retain something so much like my own life that it hardly moves me mm. than something so different from my own life. Right? When, you, when you enter the world of Odysseus, right. you're in a you're on a different planet. Yeah, it's so unlike our own experience that um, – it's hard to forget what's going on. Right. So so the act of retention is in part based in intent. Okay. Am I enter with, with a fictional piece? Yeah, yeah. Am I entering this fictional piece to be entertained, mm -hmm. to basically be able to turn my mind off for a little while and just, you know, brain candy? Yeah. Or am I trying in, in reading "Quote unquote good literature." That the, the the motive seems to be to be a better person, okay, to better understand life, to 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 be improved by reading this, right, right. Which so, is a very noble notion, I think, that we want to certainly commend, right? Well, exactly. So if your if your motive is entertainment, who cares if you remember it? Or right. Not? Yeah. It's the moment, right? It's that act itself, and at the end of it, the job is completed. I either did or did not get carried away to some other place and forget about life's troubles for a while and just enter into some of that. And that's perfectly legitimate, by the way. Totally. I am not suggesting that that's a bad motive. Good. I'm just saying that when you talk about retention, let's talk about why you want to retain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, to pick up a, a, a certain kind of novel and just read it for relaxation if if it relaxes me, the mission is accomplished, right? Boom! Yeah, to, done. To to pick up magams of human bondage and work through that thick tome, very complicated plot outside my own time. I need more motive than entertainment. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I face that all the time. Well, my favorite storyteller is Charles Dickens, and okay. students often hear that, and they. First of all, you know, if I hand them a volume, they go, whoa, that's really big. Yeah. Yes, he was long-winded. Yes, he was. <laughs> um, it, but, um, you know, what? what is my mission here? If my mission is to be just simply – be allowed to turn my mind off, Dickens is, a, is the wrong guy mm -hmm. to ask mm -hmm. for that, mm -hmm. you know – uh, my, my my neighbor Nicholas Sparks might be better. So I hope now I'm going to get myself in big trouble. Yeah, for that, easy, but. easy. <laughs> edit button. Edit button. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, and I don't even say that because of content. I say that because of contemporarity. Okay. Right. That, that somebody writing about my own time and place, I do use Nicholas Sparks in this regard. He's writing about Eastern North Carolina where I live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know many of the places that he uses in his works. And I know this because I've read his works, by the way. I'm not, wow. I'm not picking on somebody there I haven't go. read. There you go. Um, but, but I, I don't care to retain is so much of what he's writing about is already familiar to me. It's the life I already live within or I know people like it mm -hmm. so to speak that I don't feel like I have to remember it because I'm there yeah uh, yeah so so it's so it's a confirmation of your experience more than it is a perhaps a movement, movement. right yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so okay good so what sort of things do we want to retain perhaps it's good enough to say I don't know if you're wanting to dive into that question or or if it's enough to say uh, we want to retain the stuff that makes us better people. 
broadly, right? Um, because if I think if we open the can of worms on, well, what sort of stuff is that? That's like a whole nother episode, season of episodes well, so, almost, right? Right. It's almost like a, a, a problem Cicero discusses with, with friendship. Okay. Uh, Aristotle has this on his discussion of friendship as well. We have, we have friends. We know people for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And a story is basically um, developing a relationship with a fictional character yeah. or characters. Yeah. So I have those friends that I, I, I the, the guy that, that makes my sub sandwich at Subway is my friend in, only in that he's there to make me a sandwich. Yeah. We don't interact for any other reason, right? He is, he is, he is very utilitarian when it comes to a relationship with me. Mm -hmm. I got the five bucks and you got the sandwich. Let's make a deal. Yeah. Um, whereas other folks, uh, the, the relationship I had with it were much more complex and I would never boil it down to what they do for me. Mm -hmm. Right. We're, we're related at a much, much deeper level than just what you've done for me lately. Right. Type of, not to quote Janet Jackson too often on the episodes, <laughs> but, um, um, <laughs> the, 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 it's just, so why do you want this relationship? When you say I want to retain what I read and I ask the question, why mm -hmm. it, it's, it's trying to get at, like you said, to be a better person. Well, in what way, mm -hmm. if, if I'm reading this story, okay. Um, uh, oh, what's his name? Well, the author doesn't matter near as much as the work that he wrote. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's, that's a whole other episode Theoretical there. claim uh, alert. <laughs> <laughs> Highly uh, theoretical. A river yeah. runs. Yeah, yeah. A, a river runs through it. Mm -hmm. Right. If you read A River Runs Through It because you're fascinated by fishing and you think in there may be some tips to help you better be, uh, fly fish. Yeah. Okay. Legitimate. Right. Totally. You've got a motive and you heard that that's a great book about fly fishing, which it is. Yeah. But I would argue that you're missing the main point. OK. The main point is the two brothers and the dad and their relationship and the kinds of people they are and how the two brothers are really envious of each other's life, even though each is living the life they want to live. They wish they could live the other brother's life. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. The the. The, the guy that's footloose and fancy free in the movie, the, the Brad Pitt character, envies his more straight-laced brother who who at least, you know, has a paycheck coming in and has a wife and has kind of a life, yeah. which he forgoes with his footloose, fancy free life. So in – and the way they relate most notably is through fishing. So – you you're spot on if you write read the novel because it's about fly fishing and you want to know more about fly fishing or you like fly fishing i think it's going to be a thumbs up for you and you'll probably retain the things it says about fly fishing yeah but you could also pick up the book knowing nothing about fly fishing and frankly sort of like me just not into fishing yeah and and still find it a fascinating novel as i found it be because of the relationships that so so yeah. again it's back to the to the cause back to the why am i reading this and thus what do i want to get out of it and then how would i retain that and i honestly i think some of retention is just entering knowing what you want to get out of it mm. okay M too many people enter a book either because they just it, it's there it looked interesting I don't even know why it looked interesting. I'm just going to read this and see what happens. Good. And not much does happen when you when you enter aimlessly. I mean, it can, but it, it often is harder. Yeah. Or, or you know, frankly, many people's only experience with books is assignments. True. And I and I have I have discussed and, and I would love to discuss with you on the podcast sometime. The, the is is the English class killing lovers of literature, right? It, yeah. it, by making kids read stuff. Are we actually making them hate reading stuff? <laughs> yeah. Um, or are we actually and, distorting the definition of read to go back to um, right? Old uh, Adler's. 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 Yes, that's that's good. Okay, so let's um, let's. I just want to 
sort of put a lid on that question by by saying uh, one more thing about it before we move, because we really ought to get into answering Craig's question <laughs> directly, right? I think we, oh, I think what we've done, okay. I think what we've done is discuss a lot of the underpinnings that need to be, um, I think these are the more important, um, questions that arise, uh, first, uh, prior, right, right. prior to the actual retention. Um, but the premises, but, yes, exactly. Premises. Um, so, but, but I do, I want to say this about it, uh, before we move to that, to the list, um, here would be my plug for, uh, communities of readers, right? Um, wh- one, uh, w- you asked the question, what am I hoping to get out of this book? Um, one really fantastic way to vet materials, uh, to organize them and categorize them and, um, sort of be able to work through them more quickly, more easily, more readily is to have a group of people that are, that are readers, right? Because, uh, if you're reading, you can only do so much, but if you have nine other readers who are also reading, uh, and you're passing information back and forth, Hey, read the river runs through it because of this. Um, this is a book about whatever, then you are tipped off and you are constantly tipping off, um, your fellow readers, as you are working through books together, right? Um, I don't. I don't think that can be overstated. I think that um, having a having a group would be enormously beneficial uh, to to. Yeah, I would even. I, I would even ramp one step down from that and saying, talking about it is better than not. If you do, if you find it difficult to to form or keep going a group. Mm-hmm. Even discussing it with one other person, yeah, right, is 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 way better at getting the retention going, yeah, than you just reading it, closing the book, putting it on the shelf, and going on. Okay, boom. Um, so now we're now straight away we're into our our sort of more practical, although we shy away from that word. We're we're to our bullet points here. Uh, that <laughs> right. Um, one of talk the, about it. Yeah, one of the things you can do to help you retain a book. Uh, or a set of information or a story or whatever is talk about it. Uh, that is one enormously uh, helpful uh, retention, we'll call it, device. Right. The, the second is like it. Okay. Some would say it's the same one, only in a different mode. But I, I just, I warn you, most people jerk the knee mm-hmm. when they hear me say it. So let me say it and then put all my caveats around it. Okay. Because I don't mean it as seriously as it's going to sound. Uh-huh. Talking about it's incredibly powerful. Writing about it is very useful. Yes. Now, good. I don't mean the quote unquote book report. That's probably <laughs> a great way to to kill it for yeah, you. Yeah. And I don't mean uh, some big thing. I have found. Uh, so maybe this is this is a sub step or or sub box in our checklist. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have found this great online useful tool to me. Okay. It's basically a face Facebook for readers, right? Called Goodreads. Nice. Uh, it's free. Um, you can you can gather reading friends. You can they it, it promotes the writing of short reviews so that if I'm about to read a book and I put it into Goodreads, uh, I can see what other people have said. I, I often don't poison the well. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but um, but it's always in particular it's why my re- want to read list grows so quickly is is I have I don't know twenty or thirty friends in Goodreads, and when I see one of them, you know wax poetic or, or at least give a, a, a five-star rating to a book, it often goes on my want to read. Cause I, I know this person and I know the kind of reader they are and they like the book. I might like it. Great. Um, but, but the act of feeling like when I finish the book, so of course there's the delight in saying I finished the book and it has a whole stats section where you can keep track of how much you've read this year and feel real guilty about that. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, it, but but as you're completing, it gives you a, a field to, to write a little bit about what you thought. Mm-hmm. And I often will. I don't always. Sometimes it isn't worth it. Yeah. But if it was a book that affected me, I feel like because I've got friends, I give them just a – I don't spoil it. Yeah. I just liked it for these reasons. Da, 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 da. And it's amazing how that that pause before the book goes up on the shelf results – in a much better retention than than if I would have just you know snapped it shut, thrown it on the shelf, and gone away. Uh, well, it's, fifteen years from now, coming back and re- you know not even remembering that I read it. Right, and and it's just that, however brief and however tentative, that moment of assessment, right, where you are assessing yep. the book and you're saying it it forces you when. It's like uh, when you're speaking a uh, foreign language, right? When you you can hear somebody um, speaking a foreign language uh, and not understand it, or, or you can understand it like, yeah, yeah, I've got the sense. Okay, well, then say what they said. Right. And right. then it's like that. Uh, uh, like it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. But when you can, I mean, I did this all the time when I was teaching Latin, I would talk and talk and talk. But when somebody, when one of my students could, um, it's not regurgitation, when someone could answer a question or when someone could summarize uh, what I said, that is a different level of being able to... um, Yep understand, right? That, that's a new level of understanding. And so when you, um, when you require that of yourself, it is, it is a very, uh, it may seem, I don't know how it may seem, but what I'm saying is it's an important way to actually produce something. And that is a uh, very lasting in the memory when you had to do it, right? Well, and it provides an artifact Important. if it's written. That's right. Right. If it's written, it, it, it provides you with something to go back to when your memory mm-hmm. invariably does fail you. Right. And you can't as, remember as much as you wanted. I know I like that book, but I don't remember why. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so what I, about, I think that uh, right along with that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, I was going to say, so writing in the book is where that uh, leads me. Um, well, that's so, so great minds, right? Yeah. It, it, Funny anecdote. Okay. I read Adler's How to Read a Book between high school and college. Yeah. And and I had a good experience because I was not just handed it by a fellow, a, a former teacher of mine in high school, but but he followed up. And we, we had, you know, met at a McDonald's and talked about it. Nice. And th- that made all the difference in the experience for me. Mm-hmm. But in that book, he mentions and then goes into, I think there's a whole chapter on how to mark a book. And he actually wrote a book entitled How to Mark a Book. Wow. And I, I said, well, that would be good. And so I get off to college, you know, college library. It's this, this, this deep and engaging place, at least they used to be. Yeah, um, sure. and, and, and so I'm wandering around and I get in my head, I'm going to look up that book. And I found it. Now, I think Adler wrote that in the 50s. Yeah, How to Read a Book 19... was written in, in 40, 1940. And I, I, I want to say early 50s was How to Mark a Book. Okay. And it's much, much, you talked about 440 pages of How to Read a Book. How to Mark a Book is, I, I want to say, under 100 pages. Oh. It's not a lengthy book at all. Mm-hmm. And I found it, a nice little hardback copy. You know, libraries are great at, at buying the most expensive version. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, 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 I looked at it. Uh, it looked like it had been bought when it came out. Mm-hmm. It had last. Okay. And, 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 and I didn't go to college in the sixties. Okay. I know right. there's the wise acres <laughs> out there. That, <laughs> I was, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, in the mid eighties, <laughs> when I'm in college, right. it hadn't been checked out since the night, since 1967. Nice. Now that doesn't mean people hadn't picked it up and in the in in perhaps even just standing there 
thumb through it, got its ideas, and you know, it is short enough that it could have been read at it. It very well might have been read without needing to be checked out. Mm-hmm. I'll put that in there. But but the thing that cracked me up. Okay. And I went to a very strict religious college where rules were a big deal. But and that, and that might explain this. But there wasn't a single mark in the book <laughs> <laughs> entitled out of Margo book, right. <laughs> which I thought was kind of, Hey, start, start using this. Right. Stuff. Right. Uh, but, but that, it, that of, of all the notions of retention. Uh, so I follow Adler fairly uh, religiously, mm-hmm. right? I, I, uh, I skim a book. If, if, if I have a book, especially nonfiction, but, but even fiction, if I have a book that seems important, I, I give it a good look over in advance of just starting it on page one. Yeah. And then as I read it, I got to have a pen or a pencil near me. Um, I have formed my own set of critical marks. Mm-hmm. I actually don't even teach those to my students. I teach them highlighting and, and give them a different color for different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but I do mark uh, for various reasons, passages in both fiction and nonfiction. Right. Um, it, and it is amazing how the act of stopping, figuring out how much of what was just said I want to mark and in what way it ought to be marked, heightens the retention of that said passage, as opposed to just reading it, hmm, that was good, and keep on going. Mm-hmm. The, the the pause places it more cl- cleanly in the mind, in my opinion. Okay, good. So le- let me... Um... Let me talk for a minute about how my uh, sort of marking books has developed because uh, the the person who got me marking books is none other than our good pal Buck Holler. Um, oh yes, and so, but but when I started, he's really good at it. By the way, he is. He is. Uh, when I started um, teaching with Buck, and and uh, you know we were we were working together, um, I I. Well, I mean, I was young, um, 24, maybe 25. Um, I didn't, I didn't mark books at all. Um, I was fresh out of college, pretty, pretty well fresh out of college. And I hadn't read that much. Uh, so basically I could remember everything I read, right? Because I just, there wasn't that much that I'd read. Um, and I had tried marking in books a little bit, but it was, it infuriated me, uh, to come back to a book and see markings in it because I felt like it just, I just wanted to have a conversation with the author. And when somebody Uh else with their pen or pencil, uh, including a previous version of myself, uh, had interrupted that conversation, it just, it ticked me off. Um, I I really didn't like it at all. And so, you know, Buck would say, Oh man, this is an amazing book, dude. You got to read this. And he would loan me his copy and I'd just hand (laughs) it back to him. (laughs) You know, like I'm not reading this. I can't, I can't make it through because I've got too many people talking to me at the same time. I've got all these marginal notes, which now I make extensive use of. And I think are really a wonderful thing. Um, getting at that sort of sin topical reading, right. Where I'm starting to add references of my own. Uh, but you know, yeah, it, it annoyed me. Uh, but, but the change came when the, I started re- viewing reading differently. Um, and, and it's not, it didn't happen all at once, but I, I can talk about it now. Like it did, uh, of over a span of time, I came to, view reading. See, formerly what I thought reading was, was open a book, read it, get everything you can out of it, and then don't come back to it. Right. Rereading uh, was not something that I planned on doing. Um, And referencing also was not really something that I planned on doing. Um, But when I when I began to view reading as um, a sort of coming to a source for something, being affected by it, but then returning to that source over and over again, all of a sudden marking a book became a tremendous help to me, right? Because as I was, um, let's see, 
marking became my way of communicating to my future self, hey, dude, pay attention to this part. This is good, right? This has something in common with this other thing that you're reading right now or what have you. Uh, And so marking uh, has for me probably become the thing that helps me retain the most, uh, whereas it used to not have any room (laughs) in my uh, book at all. Right. So, yes, the, the, this is sort of back to my discussion of Cicero, right? That, that Mm -hmm. the guy at Subway is just giving me a sandwich. And once I've got the sandwich, that's the end of the relationship. Um, Whereas, you know, maybe a chef, let's call him chef Susan. um, I get a meal from her and am impressed with her ability so much so that I want to come back time after time to be fed, not, not, to get a good steak, but, but to get chef Susan's steak. Exactly. Right. And, and so I think, I think even a step up from that is an old practice that uh, in particular for fiction, right. I'll read a whole, what 400 page novel. Mm -hmm. And there's those four, five, six moments of, of, of metaphysical interaction. When, when, when the author has written something that's lifted me up, that is, that has yeah. made me go, wow, that was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, the mm-hmm. old habit of a commonplace book, right. Which is good. A lot, nice. of, yes. a lot of work for, in some people's minds, but if, if, if wanting to retain is so that I don't waste my time reading a book, then one of the ways you can kind of get past having to come back and reread regularly, which is not a, I mean, you know, there, there are just books that I do that with. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah it, the brothers, but yeah. if I want to keep as close to possible as your desire, uh, initially to read and be done with, then mm-hmm. I need to, I need to pick the fruit as I walk through the orchard. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and take it with me and the commonplace book, just yeah. a, a quick, I'll, I'll put in the resources section of, of the webpage for this episode a, a, a more detailed uh, discussion of commonplace. But 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 it's basically a, a reading journal, right? It's it's yeah. it's a it's a blank book, and when I read something I really like, I go through the act of copying it down into my commonplace book, and mm-hmm. that by its own act, yeah. puts it more into my mind. It's amazing how I can remember that quote so much more clearly and so much more verbatim having gone through mm-hmm. the act of copying it and, and, and by hand into a commonplace book, as opposed to a lot of people read online these days and want to, want to copy and paste. That's not, that's not sending your brain through the act of re stating it, it th- again in your mind. It's, it's a, right. It's just an electronic act maybe if you sure. tag it and reference it correctly it's it's a quick way to find the the quote again but right. um well but i mean if you want to talk retention boom you retained it like you you have taken it and put it in a place where uh it's a commonplace book like if you ever are going oh yeah what was walker percy saying well boom open it up okay here it is hey sweet this is the quote right and you have it like so by definition, you may not have retained it sort of in your mind, the precise quote, but you've uh, captured it enough that you, um, you don't have to look through an effect, right? You don't have to go back through the whole and book, have trying to, where was that place? Where was that place? And even with the marking, right. sometimes that can mm-hmm. be frustrating, you know, several hundred page yeah, book yeah, yeah. and I can't right. remember. So, and, 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 and just to helpful hints with the commonplace, cause I've taught it to students over the years. Um, I, mm-hmm. I think depending on your reading, it, it, you should keep them chronologically. And I often suggest to students that they pair it up with the use of something like Goodreads. Uh, one of my friends just keeps an Excel file in, in which he lists uh, what was read, the author. Uh, I think he likes to keep track of how many pages. And then in particular, he, I read it from this date to this date. Gotcha. Because if if I'm trying to remember what Walker Percy said, and I read that several years ago, I'm much more likely to remember roughly when I read it. So if my if my commonplace mm-hmm. books are aligned chronologically, 
and I, so I read that in in 2016. Uh, okay, so so now I've narrowed down. And I'm not saying I have a hundred commonplace books, but but if I have multiple commonplace books, I know I know roughly which volume yeah. to go into, and then it's a matter of flipping a few pages until oh, there's Walker Percy. Oh, and there's that quote. Um, Boom. Yeah, I, I I mean I that's good. Feel like readers like you and I could could bury <laughs> here in uh, in practical yeah. suggestions. I think the key is what that's a good start. Yeah, I, I, the key, I think, is is up front having having the the mission figured out. Why why am I reading this? Uh, it does a lot for you. But then mm-hmm. then there are uh, there is an art, right? And and uh, I'm constantly just like you and Buck. I, I'm constantly sort of looking over the shoulder of good readers, uh, trying to figure out how they how they do what they do, so that I can do it better. Uh, it, right. it's an apprenticeship, yeah, that's right? Good. It's an apprenticeship. I think that's the point you're making with the reading group is that you learn a lot more about reading by reading with others, uh, than you would on your own. That's right. That's right. So, um, okay. Well, if you've made it this far, then, uh, you really ought to, uh, read, uh, love in the ruins, uh, with us. Uh, it is a book by Walker Percy, um, and we're going to be discussing uh, that text uh, at a future date. Uh, we're <laughs> it's a novel, and it has those metaphysical moments uh, that you talked about, Steve. Um, and so we invite our listeners to uh, read along with us and uh, enjoy that discussion uh, as it comes along. Um, additionally, uh, thank you, Craig, for sending in your question. Uh, it was, uh, fun for, uh, us to kick around. I hope you, um, got what you were looking for <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I don't know. Steve, closing thoughts. An hour in, I really don't have any more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> 